as a church, we're going through the wonderful book of Colossians, and taking a journey through that, we find that Jesus Christ is sufficient for all of our needs. And last week, I mentioned that your beliefs will dictate your behavior. And uh, some of us really don't believe that. Some of us sort of compartmentalize our lives, and we say, well, this is my life over here, you know, and this is the things that I'm going to do, and, and um, you know, and that's completely separate from my church life. That's completely separate from Jesus. That's completely separate from my spiritual life. But the reality is that if Jesus is Lord, he's not just Lord of some certain compartment of your life. He's Lord of it all. And so Jesus uh, desires to be Lord of that area of life that you might be tempted to say, well, this is mine. This is where I am. And this is where I'm the boss. Um, And so if your behavior in life seems to be split between two different ways, you know, this is the way I behave and that's completely separate from my belief in Jesus, it actually says something about your belief in Jesus. It says that your belief in Jesus is insufficient. Your belief in Jesus is not who the Bible says Jesus really is. And so, if you truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that will dictate your behavior. Your theology influences your ethics. Your doctrine determines what you do. And this is true in every arena of your life. And today I want to show you exactly how that is true, how who you understand Jesus Christ to be influences and affects your life. And so if you have a Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians is in the New Testament, toward the back of your Bible. And we're in this series called Christ Overflowing. In Colossians chapter 1, I want you to see that the subject of the passage that we're studying today is none other than the person of Jesus Christ. Now, when we read verses 15 through 17, which we'll do today, you'll notice that the name Jesus does not appear. You'll you'll notice that the title Christ, which means Messiah, does not appear. It simply refers to he and him. And so who is the he and the him that it refers to? We have to go back a few verses to understand that it's truly Jesus Christ. So if you look at verse 4 of Colossians chapter 1, we read this. Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, And he says to these Christians, We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. And so there it's very clear that Paul is talking about their faith in who? In Christ Jesus. Jesus. And again, in verses 13 and 14, Paul makes it clear again. He says that God has rescued us from the domain of darkness, and he's transferred us into the kingdom of who? The kingdom of the Son he loves. So God has taken us, and he's moved us from a kingdom, a a spiritual sphere, a realm of darkness and of sin and of death, and he's transferred us into a different spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of the Son of God. And this is Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 14, In him, in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so as we move forward in these verses, verses 15 through 17, Please understand that the he and the him that Paul is referring to is Christ Jesus. And so I would ask you, if you have found Colossians chapter 1, uh, we will read verses 15 through 17. I'd ask you that you stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Three little verses. Scripture says, he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd give us wisdom and insight into who the person of Jesus Christ is and how that knowledge affects our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So here's the situation. Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, a church that he did not found, uh, the church where he was not the one who led the uh, people there to Christ. And so he's writing to a bunch of people, most of whom he doesn't even know, and he's telling them in the very first chapter of this letter, uh, sort of a long letter, uh, that he uh, wants them to know who Jesus Christ is. And there's a reason for that. And here's the reason. The reason is, is that back in that day, there was a very prevalent belief, and it's very prevalent in our day as well, but there's a very prevalent belief among the people in that day, 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, and it was very prevalent among the people who lived in Colossae, and it was an idea, it was a mindset, it was a belief, and it seemed to make sense. In fact, it seemed to be sort of harmless. Uh, it seemed to be the way to live your life. If you want your life to be fulfilling and you want your life to be meaningful. Uh, but the problem was this. That the people who accepted this idea. The people who believed. The people who, who adopted this mindset as their own. Ultimately would be left unfulfilled. Not fulfilled. And so the idea that they believed turned, to, turned out to be a big lie. It was a lie. It was an empty promise that did not fulfill people, but left them empty. Here was the big lie. The lie was this, that Jesus Christ is insufficient for you. And so seeking spiritual experiences, seeking spiritual knowledge apart from Christ, it could be good. It could be fulfilling. Well, this same idea is very prevalent in our nation today. It's very prevalent in our community today. You see, there are people today that will fill up their lives with everything under the sun. And they'll, they'll believe uh, that this might fulfill them or that might fulfill them. And so they turn to this and that. They turn to everything under the sun to try to find meaning and fulfillment in their lives. And they listen to people who say, well, you know, uh, Jesus, he may be one way to God, but he's not the only way to God. And so they may, they may go and uh, try to find some other way to God, some other way and means to fulfillment. And so they, they may turn to Hinduism, or they may turn to Buddhism, or they may turn to Islam and say that, you know, maybe this will help me find peace and fulfillment. They might try to be a good person, thinking that being a good person and engaging in good works and helping enough little old ladies across the street might ultimately give them fulfillment. And, uh, and they find that all of that's wrong. And so maybe they don't find fulfillment in any type of religious arena. Maybe they turn to hedonism. And they say, well, I'm, I'm just going to pursue this money over here and these possessions over there, and I'm going to uh, turn to this philosophy and live my life according to this philosophy or that philosophy. And the reality is that none of these things are really good and fulfilling in the end. And the danger that Paul is concerned about, because he's writing to the church, he's writing to Christians, okay? He's not writing to lost people. He's not writing to unbelievers because unbelievers, lost people, will, in fact, seek to find fulfillment in all of these various means. But he's writing to Christians because he's concerned that they might fall into the, into the temptation of trying to find fulfillment for their lives apart from Christ. And so he doesn't want them to engage in the lie. You end up trying to get water out of dry wells when you do that. And so no matter what possession you have or philosophy you adopt or, or religious belief that you say is mine, there will be nothing that will be able to fulfill or to fill, I should say, the God-shaped vacuum 
inside the human heart. Only God in Christ can fill that. And so Paul is writing to these Christians. He does not want them to believe in this lie. And so he tells them who Jesus Christ is. Why? Because if they have a good understanding, a proper understanding of the fullness of who Jesus Christ is, then they will not turn to sorry counterfeits that will leave them unfulfilled. And so the truth is this. And Christian, you need to know the truth. The truth is that Jesus Christ is sufficient for you. And so, Christian, when you need help, when you need wisdom, when you need provision, you ought to seek God's will in Christ. You see, there's a lot of us who claim to be followers of Christ, but I wonder how many of us really know the person that we say we follow. Christ is not insufficient in any way. Now, your understanding of Christ might be insufficient. In fact, that may be the reason that you seek out spiritual experiences and spiritual knowledge elsewhere apart from Christ because you believe Christ can't meet your needs. You believe that your version of who Jesus is is somehow insufficient for you. But I want to show you that the true Jesus is not insufficient in any way. And so today, in the next two weeks, we will examine very carefully what Paul says to the Colossian believers about who Jesus Christ is. In verse 15 of the passage that we just read, it reads this way again, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. What does this mean, he's the image of the invisible God? Well, sometimes the Bible uses two, two terms almost interchangeably, but they're a little bit different. Sometimes the Bible talks about likeness, and sometimes the Bible talks about image. And so uh, the, these two terms are, are very important. And it's, it's important that we understand these two terms. Way back in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You fast forward just a little bit, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Adam was 130 years old. When he fathered a son, and I just have to say, way to go, Adam. When he fathered a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. And so the the words likeness and image are, are connected, as you can imagine. But there's a very important distinction. Likeness typically means outward appearance, but image usually means the exact and complete representation in all things, including character. So sometimes you might be able to look at a child, and just by looking at that child, you would, you would say, oh, that, that child just look, looks just like his daddy, or just look, looks just like her mama. And that's what the Bible means by likeness. But sometimes you can watch a child, and that child behaves just like his or her daddy or mommy, whether that's good or whether that's not so good. That's what this passage in Colossians means by image. Image is the idea of the apple not falling far from the tree as they say. And so Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what is God like? And if you have any idea of what God is like, try to answer that question apart from your knowledge of Christ. What is God like? What thoughts are in the mind of God? 
what feelings are in the heart of God? We have no way of knowing. Because God is too distant. God is too invisible. God is too beyond us. Except for one thing. We know what Christ is like. Whoever has seen the Son has seen the Father. We know God's character because we know the character of Christ. We know God's heart because we know the heart of Christ. We know God's thoughts. Why? Because Christ told us the Father's thoughts. Hebrews 1 says it this way. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. And so, Christian, here's the point. When you turn aside from Christ to seek wisdom and help and provision elsewhere, you are turning away from the one who is the image of the invisible God. Verse 15 continues. It tells us that Christ is firstborn over all creation. He's the firstborn over all creation. What does this mean? Well, sometimes in the Bible, firstborn means the one who was born first. Uh, it means the, the, the person who's the, uh, the very first one to come along. And so we typically use this when we talk about firstborn. If I were to ask you, who is your firstborn child? You would tell me the name of the child that was born first. And so is this what Paul's saying? Is Paul saying that, that Jesus is the first thing that God created before God created all other things? No, he's not saying that at all. That is not what the passage teaches. How do I know? Because all you need to do is to read the very next verse to dispel that idea. We read, for everything was created by him, by Christ, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have, be, have been created through Christ and for Christ. You see, the whole point of this passage is to show us that the person that we have faith in is sufficient for our every need. You see, if Jesus was part of the creation, then he would be lacking in some respect. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Is there any one created thing in all of the universe that can meet all of your needs? No, there's not. I need air to breathe. I need water to drink. Those are two very different things. I need food to eat. Again, that's very different than water or air. I need blood flowing through my veins. Again, that's something else entirely than the other three. And in that blood, I need red blood cells and white blood cells to live. Okay? I need, I just named at least four different things there that I need just to survive. There's not one created thing in the universe that can meet all of your needs. And so if there was someone who could meet all of your needs, give you all the help that you need, give you all the wisdom that you need, give you all the provisions that you need, then that someone could not be created. Only the Creator is able to meet all of your needs. And that is who Jesus Christ is. He is the Creator. So what does verse 15 mean when it says He's the firstborn? over all creation. If it doesn't mean that he was born first, if it doesn't mean that he was the first created thing that God created, then what does firstborn actually mean? 
Well, the Bible has a second meaning for the term firstborn. And the second meaning for the term firstborn means this. Supreme in rank. Preeminent. The big boss. The one over all. That is the second meaning for firstborn. And that is the meaning here. I'll show you. Do you remember Israel's greatest king? Who was it? It was King David, right? Here's King David. Was King David the firstborn in his family? No, not at all. He was the lastborn. He was the last of eight sons, far, far, far from being the one who was born first. Yet look at what God says about King David in Psalm 89, verse 27. God says this, I will make him my firstborn, greatest of the kings of the earth. Do you see how firstborn can be used as supreme in rank? The one who is the top chief, the top dog, if you will. The one who is over all the others. And that is what we mean, that's what Paul means by calling Jesus the firstborn over all creation in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Christ is preeminent. Christ is supreme in rank. What Paul is saying about Christ in Colossians 1.15 is that Christ rules over all of creation and over every created thing. He is king over creation. This is the one that you've placed your faith in, Christian. Christ is the creator. Verse 16 continues, For everything was created by him. Not just everything that we see. Not just everything on earth. But everything in the heavenly realm as well. God created Every invisible creature in the spiritual realm. God created angels. Christ created angels. Both those that remain good and holy. And Christ created the angels who, by their own free will, chose to rebel against God. In verse 16, the words thrones, dominions, Rulers and authorities all refer to these beings in the spiritual realm. Christ created them all. The last part of verse 16 says that all things were created through Christ. John chapter 1 verse 3 says the same thing. All things were created through Him. And apart from Him, John writes, not one thing was created that has been created. Here's the idea of all things being created through Christ. The idea is this, that God the Father is the ultimate source of creation. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the agent that God the Father used to create all things. God created all things through Christ. And sometimes people wonder, well, you know, why? why? Why did God create everything? Why, why did God uh, create these beings in the spiritual realm? Are they really necessary, you know? Why did God create angels? Why did God create the devil? And I want you to understand something very clearly. This idea that God and the devil are equals, they're just playing on different teams, is a lie. They are not equal. God is supreme. So why did God create the devil? I want you to remember the devil is a fallen angel. And God did not create angels to be fallen angels. God created angels. He gave them their own free will. And some freely chose to rebel. And some of those rebellious angels are now imprisoned and others have some limited freedom to do damage on the earth, but there's coming a day when every single one of them will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is over all. He alone is Lord. The reason that God created all things through Christ was to glorify Himself. 
And you might say, well, that sounds sort of selfish to just glorify yourself. I want you to understand something. There's nothing selfish about it at all. Have you ever seen a great masterpiece, a great work of art? Here is the, this master painter or this master sculptor or this master musician spending years, perhaps, of their lives creating their most magnificent masterpiece. And once it's finally finished, and everyone looks at that incredible masterpiece, not only do they say, look at that masterpiece, but it also reflects something about the person who created it. What a magnificent artist Michelangelo was right? The piece of art says something about the creator of the art. And here we have this incredible world, this incredible world. We have the universe with all of the hundreds of billions of galaxies, things that we have not discovered. We have creatures swimming in the depths of the, of the sea that we have not yet discovered. We have parts of ourselves that we have not yet discovered. There was a time when when scientists thought that the human cell was the smallest thing that they could imagine. And then they discovered molecules, and they discovered neutrons and protons, and and they discovered all types of things, quarks, and, and things even smaller than that. All of this says something about the one who created it all. And it brings glory to God. I want you to understand that the act of creation was not a selfish act. It was was an act of love. The act of creation was an act of love. You see, God created us because he loves us. And he wants us to experience him. We give God joy. And God wants us to experience his joy. And God created us through Christ so that we, believers, might be the bride of Christ. I want you to think about this, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, these three persons of the Godhead had perfect harmony and unity they needed nothing outside of themselves and yet God created this world and he created us in it so that those that believe in God might be presented to the son of God as a bride so that you and I would receive the love that Jesus has to offer us. The act of creation was an act of love. And all of this brings glory to God. And Christ actually shares his glory with us, the Bible says. That is, that is an incredible thought. That Jesus Christ would not just give us his love. That would be enough. But the Bible says that Christ will share his glory with us. We don't deserve that. We don't even deserve his love. But Christ gives us all of this. All of this is in Christ. All things have been created through Christ and for Christ. Verse 17 continues. It says that Christ, he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. What does that mean, Christ is before all things? We're talking about time, time and space here. That's what is meant by before. It means that Jesus Christ has always existed. Jesus Christ is pre-existent. He existed before time began. Jesus created time. Try to think of that one. 
That's a tough one right there. But there has never been a time in which God the Son did not exist. You see, as the Creator, as the one who created all things, back on that day, the very first day of creation, there would be, at least in our minds, this type of idea. Everything stands on one of two sides. It is either the Creator or it is created. And God the Son stands on the side of the Creator. He created all things. And it stands to reason that if He created all things, that He existed prior to the creation of all things. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God was already there before the beginning. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word. The word Word refers to Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God when? In the beginning, before anything else began. You see, when you and I understand that Christ has always existed, it means this. It means that we have the assurance that our Lord and Savior has seen it all. Nothing escapes His notice. He has meticulously planned out His masterpiece called creation. And we are the beneficiaries of it. And we, in fact, are the highest part of His creation. Because we are made in the very image of God. And Jesus Christ didn't just create all things and then stand back and let it go. No, no, no. Verse 17 tells us that He is the sustainer of all things. Not only is He before all things as the Creator, but by Him all things hold together. He sustains all things. The Creator has not forgotten His creation. Every single day, at every moment of every day, Christ keeps all things in order and in balance. I will probably never be able to understand how you can take hydrogen, which is highly flammable, and oxygen, which is needed to produce a fire, Put them together and you get water that puts out fires. I, I do not understand how that happens. There's probably some scientist somewhere that can explain everything, but I know this, that Christ holds all things together. That song that we sang a few minutes ago, that African-American traditional song, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's from Colossians 1.17. He's the sustainer of all things. And if Christ has all things in his hands, then that means you. Christ has you in his hands. Isn't that a wonderful place to be? In the hands of the eternal, immortal creator of all things that's where you are christian you're in his hands you see if you are a follower of christ there's no need to turn aside from him and start looking for spiritual experiences and knowledge from other sources there's no need to look to pseudo-christian cults like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or societies that cloak their teachings in secrecy. Because all of these fail all three tests of heresy. They teach falsehoods about who Jesus is, saying that he's insufficient and that's why you need them. They teach falsehoods about how to be saved, saying that Christ's work on the cross is insufficient, and you have to earn your salvation by good works. 
and they teach falsehoods about the scriptures, saying that God's word is insufficient and that you need other sources of authority to give you spiritual knowledge. All of it are lies. Christ is sufficient. His work on the cross is sufficient. And the word of God is sufficient for your every need. You see, if you are a follower of Christ, then you follow the only person who has revealed the invisible God. If you're a follower of Christ, then you follow the supreme ruler over all of creation. If you're a follower of Christ, then you follow the creator of all physical things, the creator of all spiritual things. You follow the agent of God the Father. If you're a follower of Christ, then you follow the one for whom all things have been made. If you're a follower of Christ, you follow the eternal one, the pre-existent one. If you're a follower of Christ, you follow the sustainer of all things. You see, Jesus Christ is sufficient for your every need. Christian, if your life is unfulfilling, it is not due to your Savior. If your life is unfulfilling, you are not trusting enough or believing the right things about Him. You need to connect with the one who has saved your soul. You can be in Christ today if you have never before given your heart and your life to Christ. When you do that, like I said at the beginning of the message, when you give your life and your heart to Christ, God transfers you from a kingdom of darkness and sin and sickness and death, a, a, a kingdom that is passing away. He transfers, transfers you spiritually into a new kingdom, and it's called being in Christ. So how can you be in Christ? You need to recognize who Jesus is. He's the Lord over all. You also need to understand what he did for you. He died on a cross for you to pay for your sins. He rose from the grave for you to give you and me eternal life. If you trust in him and confess him as Lord, he will come into your life and you will be in Christ. 